Hello, my name is David Schmidt. I'm with the University of Minnesota, and this is the third lesson, Adapting to a Changing Climate, alternatively titled Managing Risk in a Changing Climate. I thought this quote was interesting. It comes from Climate and Man, uh, Yearbook in Agriculture, 1941 from USDA. What it says is, of the greatest upsetters and interrupters of human plans and activities is climate, including weather. What I thought was important was it must constantly be taken into account in the calculations of agriculture and industry if smooth operation is to be achieved. So this whole calculating of the weather and climate and how it affects animal ag, I think is part of the message that we're trying to get across in this uh, online course. There are real climate impacts. We talked about them in the last lesson. Uh, this is another one, Iowa Beef Center 1995 report. 3,750 cattle deaths in a 13 county area over a two day period. Um, it was early in the season, July 12th and 11th, resulting in about a 2.32% death loss. But here's a little bit of the rest of the story, thinking about um, how much should be invested by a farmer to prevent these death losses. Uh, lots with shade had 0.2% death loss. Lots with no shade averaged 4.8% death loss with other factors being the weight of the animals, the color of the animals, direction of slope. So some simple things um, resulted in some dramatic results in this, um, in this particular heat wave. Uh, also noted in the article was sprinkling with fire hose had a significant impact. On it. So the question is then, how should we adapt to a changing climate? Heat and humidity, we talked about uh, the impacts, precipitation variability, or extreme weather events. Uh, through the course of this short introduction, we're gonna talk about these different types of impacts and adapting to those impacts. Um, and in your additional readings, we'll see some more specific examples about how to um, adapt to these changes. The question then, how should, how should we adapt to a changing climate? The answer is, ranges from nothing, do nothing, all the way across the board to um, some very significant changes that could be made on the feedlot or livestock production system. So in trying to answer that question, uh, some people like you saw in the Iowa beef um, report where they added shade structures, a fairly economical way of responding or adapting to climate change. This happens to be a feedlot in Western Minnesota where they made a different decision looking at uh, both long-term heat impacts um, so generally warm temperatures that we've been having and, uh, and also the long, the short term heat waves and they had some death loss with those heat waves the last few years um, and they decided that they were going to invest in an enclosed structure. So for about half of their animals, they have them now under roof. Uh, the roof is insulated to protect uh, from uh, more protection from the heat. Also, they have included in the system uh, a system for uh, collecting all the runoff from the site. Um, and they looked and these economics to them were favorable in the long term. And so they built the structure and they're studying right now is to see how much better the animals do in this enclosed structure. Another example of possibly an extreme adaptation um, this is a 900 head swine gestation and farrowing site and also in western Minnesota um, and they installed geothermal cooling and that cooling um, uh, takes cold water out of the ground or tempered water out of the ground runs it through a heat exchanger and into some um, tempering hallways in the facility um, and so their barns are cool in the summertime. And so it was a significant investment, but uh, looking at the improvements in um, number of sows produced per pig and some other improvements in performance, they found this to be very cost effective. So what is interesting, it will be even more cost effective uh, if there is some increases in temperature over the next 20 or 50 years. This is a long range plan um, and it will protect them against that additional heat. So like I said, there's many ways to look at this and try and figure out how we adapt to this climate, changing climate. Um, first, we look at the damage cost saying, you know, death loss, death loss, performance, 
many ways to look at the damage from the different climate impacts, but then also looking at the probability of these impacts. So the probability of a flood event occurring, probability of a, of a, a heat wave, probability of a drought, um, all these come into play in estimating this probability of some sort of damage cost. Um, not an easy calculation to make. Uh, we can use some historic data to provide us with some guidance. So look at the recent probability of heat waves. We saw in the last lesson that if you're somewhere in the middle of Nebraska, you have a one in four chance of, um, one year in four of having a, a significant heat wave. We can look at the 25 year, 24 hour storms, thinking about precipitation events and intensities, thinking about uh, responding and preparing for floods. These 25 year, 24 hour storm events um, have been changing over the last several years. And if we look at those new um, storm events and probably those events it might help us guide our decision in how we plan or adapt to this change in climate. What about snow loads, wind load? We can look at recent historic data and suggest uh, maybe give us some guidance on how to respond. The cost then of the avoided damage. So this is the cost of installing that shade structure or building that geothermal system. And we compare these two costs, this to here, to try and make that decision. And like I said, the challenge is looking at the probability. If we knew there was gonna be a heat wave every year, obviously we'd be preparing our facilities uh, for heat waves. But since we don't know that, we're stuck with looking at the probabilities of the weather and making some uh, educated decisions to help us in the planning process. Uh, just a couple of definitions. Um, the title of the slide of the presentation is adaptation, also risk management. And if we think about adaptation, it's a lot of times used um, in city planning right now. They're adapting to climate change and writing plans for climate change. There's an um, example here. Chicago Climate Action Plan, um, where they are looking at the increases in heat and humidity, thinking about how their city will respond, maybe with making sure they have enough hospital beds to handle people under heat stress. Also, maybe some cooling centers around town and the capacity of those cooling centers. They're also looking at precipitation. Uh, intense precipitations might require different storm sewer sizing if they're looking out planning for the next 30 years. They're putting in new sewer systems. They're going to look at sizing for increased rainfall events. Uh, maybe if they're planting trees or grasses in the parks, they're looking at drought tolerant um, uh, plants. Um, also looking at flood evacuation routes and other things to help them um, with that long range planning of the city. So this kind of, but in agriculture, we typically think of risk management, the process of assessing risk and acting in such a manner as to avoid or minimize the loss associated with such a risk. Um, so that's, um, I'm using the word slightly interchangeable here in this lesson. Here's some general uh, concepts in this adaptation um, that I think the terminology is kind of telling. It's used often in the city planning for climate change. Um, reduce exposure, increase resilience, Reduce vulnerability, transformation, prepare, respond, and recover, transfer, and share risks. Before we get into too many more details about these particular terms and how they might be applied to the farm, I want to go through just a couple of uh, general concepts in this adaptation that is specific to, to livestock production. Um, when we look at pasture and outdoor systems, they are the most exposed to climate and weather. Um, and I think that's a vulnerability that they have. Other, rather than integrated systems, integrated meaning crop and livestock systems, um, because these systems typically have some buffered livestock environments. So that's the building um, that tempers that environment. But integrated systems also have to, um, are supplying their own feed, which then integrates them more closely with the climate and weather conditions. Um, whereas intensive systems, they have the buffered livestock environment um, they are not growing their own feed, but that means that they're more dependent possibly on global feed pricing and they are less diversified typically. So are a little bit more confined in, in um, spreading that risk. So if we first look at heat and humidity, the general principles that are involved in adapting to this higher heats and higher humidities, um, we can look at buffering the environment. So this is in um, 
uh, thinking about things like shade if you're in outdoor systems or indoor systems, you can look at insulation, ventilation, and cooling. There's a multiple ways of doing these that are a function of the species and type of building that you have. Um, also, there's dietary changes in all animal species that are, are better for hotter weather. We can look at management things like uh, water supply, stocking density, animal activity, uh, transportation of the animals, all those things that affect, um, that could put additional stress on the animals uh, during these heat conditions. We can look at genetics. Genetics, things like color coat if they're in outdoor systems, but also looking at heat tolerance, maybe some animals are more tolerant to heat. Uh, a lot of the higher producing animals are actually less tolerant to heat, so there's some balance that has to be made between um, the animal performance and their heat tolerance. Uh, we can look at then maybe something like diversification of the farm, so heat and humidity. Um, is there some other ways to diversify to reduce um, the impact of climate changes? And finally, ex and extremely, uh, relocation depending on the climate conditions. I think there's always that chance of um, migration of farms depending on how the climate changes. Thinking then about variable precipitation, both intensity and timing, uh, pasture systems are probably most vulnerable. So looking at stocking density, how many animals are out on that pasture, making sure that there's enough forage for all of them. Um, next would be access to water. Uh, many of these uh, pasture systems are uh, make use of farm ponds. And if there's not enough rain, then those farm ponds are dried up. So looking at access to water, drought tolerant forages to help prevent against the uh, variable precipitation and supplemental feed supplies. If we look at integrated systems, so this is crop and livestock and livestock. We have uh, same thing, drought tolerant crops. So uh, planting corn varieties that are more tolerant to drought. Supplemental feed supply. Where's that feed coming from if we can't grow it on our own farm? Um, looking at erosion control, possibly in those intensive rainfall events. And some things as simple as manure management when we're looking at uh, overtopping of manure storage structures because of um, intensive rainfall events. And finally, intensive systems. Uh, intensive systems typically are less affected by precipitation unless there's a large drought or flood impacting the feed supply. So looking at where that feed supply comes from, making sure that they have multiple sources for their feed supply. Um, with extreme weather events, we're talking mostly about natural disaster response planning. So looking at adequate feed and water supplies, should there be um, extreme floods, extreme drought, um, looking at backup power supplies, and then alternative routes if flooded roads and bridges. So looking at how to prepare and plan for these extreme weather events. So here's a simple example looking at this principles of adaptation. If we look at uh, rangeland and the possibility of drought, so this is outdoor animals on a range. We can look at reducing our exposure to this drought by looking at some farm diversification. So maybe not all the animals are on pasture or out on the rangeland. Um, we can look at increasing our resilience. That would be some possibly some drought tolerant forages. Reducing vulnerability might be uh, our reducing of our stocking density. We can look at transformation. Maybe there's some genetic modifications or over time. We're gonna change our genetics on our farm to account for that. Um, the protect against drought. We can look at alternative feed supplies, making sure that we have a backup plan for where to get alternative feed. We can then look at, uh, for transfer and sharing risk, we can look at our marketing opportunities or some insurance. Um, another example would be precipitation and manure management. So thinking about intense rainfall events, reducing exposure, we might look at clean water diversions to make sure that there's um, less water coming into our manure storage structure. We can look at increasing resilience, maybe maintain more freeboard on that manure storage structure so we are prepared for those intense rainfall events. We can look at maybe reducing vulnerability by installing a cover. Transformation might include long-term planning for adding more storage to that site or changing our system so we need less manure storage. As with all manure management planning, there's always a need for emergency response plan. Should we overtop our manure storages? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna protect the rivers and streams? Um, we can look at transfer and sharing risk once again using um, insurance as an example, uh, where we can 
take off some of our own personal risk by purchasing insurance. There is no silver bullet in adaptation planning. I think it's uh, difficult to choose. Do you do the low cost investment uh, sprinkling system or shade cloth? Maybe a little bit more uh, structure involved or possibly even as we saw in Western Minnesota uh, putting up a building, each of these has its own cost and benefit analysis that has to be worked through. And there's no simple answer to that. So making that decision on how to adapt and how to make a plan for adapting to climate change um, uh, requires uh, consideration of several things. Uh, the first of them uh, being these local and regional climate we can look at the historic climate that we saw in lesson one, being the heat and humidity changes in the past 20 years. We can also look at future predictions for heat and humidity or variable precipitation or extreme weather events and plan according to those weather events and our best estimate of what we think we will see in our immediate area. But not to forget that there's some national global climate issues that will affect uh, feed costs, and maybe the market price of the animals or any of the products we produce on the farm, milk, eggs, um, will be affected. So we can look at, so we must be aware of the national and global climate issues also. But beyond our climate considerations, we have to look at the specific farm operations. So we all know that species specific, if you're dealing with a poultry um, farm versus a swine farm versus a dairy farm versus a beef farm, there'll be some different adaptation practices and decisions that need to be made. So also, if we look at the specific farm operation, look at the finances and long range farm goals, that will lead us to a different decision in adaptation. We can look at the management structure of the farm, uh, vertically integrated versus something else, and how that decision will be different based on that management structure. We can also look at the current equipment and facilities saying that um, these will be factors in that decision making process. I think it's the most important thing out of this lesson is that this that we have to study the issue in depth. We have to look at the climate and the weather, local and global. We have to understand what the issues are and make our best judgment as to how this is going to be changing for us. We also have to look at options for adaptation, new technologies, manage, management strategies that are available to us. And we're going to have several of these um, listed in the additional readings that you have for this lesson, but know that it's a continual process of looking for these new technologies and management strategies. And then the complexity of economic analysis. I think that as time goes on, this will be more important looking at um, risk management, looking at cost benefit analysis of these adaptation um, technologies. Things that were not cost effective in the past might now be cost effective depending on the climate changes. Um, and finally, there's no single solution to any of this adaptation discussion. Um, there's no one size fits all. Every farm is different. Um, every geographic area is different. And so it's just a matter of paying attention to all these things and making the best decision. Thank you for your time. Uh, as with all the lessons, more information is available at the project website. Thank you.